morning or maybe afternoon by now, everyone. Um, some of you might remember me. I gave a talk yesterday on a bonefish population assessment for South Eleuthera, and now I'm kind of shifting gears talking about the presence of pollution in pelagic recreational fish such as dolphin fish and tunas. And really the interest that drives this change in uh, research is recreational fish are critically important to the Bahamian, the U.S., the global economy. So before I get going, let me just put this out. Um, this is a website that I started that really is driven by citizen scientists. It's a location for anyone who observes an animal that's been impacted by plastic, whether it's a pot cake with his face stuck in a peanut butter jar or a whale with a derelict fishing net wrapped around its fin. This provides a location for people across the globe to kind of document it, whether there's a photo or not, and allows people to really start to understand the, ex the spatial and the uh, impact, the spatial impact that plastic has on our environment. So plastic really is a global issue. Uh, in the last 40 years, plastic production has increased 620%, and I challenge anyone in this room to take a look at themselves and find something that they're wearing or using that does not contain plastic. Of this production, 275 million metric tons makes it into the landfills each year. Now, and that's just by coastal population, so people living with it, within at least 100 miles of the coast. Of that, almost 5 to 12 million tons is estimated to make it into the ocean through mismanaged waste. That's waste, plastic pollution that doesn't make it into the garbage can, plastic pollution that gets washed out of a drainage canal. Now, what exactly does 5 to 12.7 million tons of plastic look like? The annual, the annual global tuna fishery harvests approximately 5 million metric tons of uh, fish each year. So at the low end of that estimate, the same amount of tuna that are coming out of our seas, uh, the equivalent weight of plastic is going in, and up to one and a half times that, really. Um, for a volume idea, we're looking at almost a grocery bag full of plastic waste per foot of shoreline across the entire globe entering the oceans each year. So really, a lot of plastic with some pretty uh, serious impacts. Now, once in the environment, a lot of you are probably familiar with the gyres that accumulate plastic, and this is just due to natural currents, wind, and other processes that kind of create these rotational currents that collect plastic as it enters the ocean, and they accumulate in the five major ocean gyres. And of course, this is the North Atlantic subtropical gyre, and if we take a closer look at the Bahamas in relation to this gyre, we can see how plastic accumulates off the Caribbean here, uh, the Bahamas here, and the U.S. East Coast here. Uh, we see that where the Bahamas are situated is kind of right at the edge of this primary uh, accumulation zone off the East Coast of the U.S., where densities of plastic in the surface environment range between about 2,500 and 5,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. Now that number is going to be important when I show the results from our current study, so try to keep that in mind. Due to the Gulf Stream and the currents coming on the eastern side of the Caribbean, this plastic could be coming from really anywhere in the ocean, and it passes through and slowly accumulates in about a, off the east coast of the U.S. here. So the plastic that we see eventually makes its way up into here. Now, what are the impacts of plastic on wildlife? Uh, there's, people have seen a lot of photos that really play on our emotions for seeing animals in distress. Uh, this picture was sent to me by folks out in Hawaii doing a trash cleanup. And this is a picture of a common myrrh. You guys might be familiar with a recent bird die-off on the west coast of Alaska. And they found that some of these birds actually succumb to plastic entanglement as well. So plastic in the environment can result in the entanglement, asphyxiation, intestinal blockage of animals, and false fullness for animals that consume a lot of plastic means they don't feed enough, they're not able to actually get any nutrients from their foraging because they're so full of plastic. And of course there's internal damage, but I think the real issue here is that of organic pollutants. Now persistent organic pollutants really are a byproduct of industrialization, pesticides, some are used as flame retardants in plastic or other, or other uh, uh, 
industrial products. But the reason that they're bad is, first of all, they're persistent. Once they're in the environment, they're there. Okay? And they're hydrophobic. And when they come in contact with plastic in the environment, the plastic acts almost like a sponge. The pollutants are adsorbed to the outside of the plastic. Now, these POPs, as I'll refer to them, are hormone disrupting, that it can be carcinogenic. And we've seen in birds and also cetaceans that plastic loading actually correlates with POP loading in the animal, reproductive failure, and sometimes even premature death in these animals. Now, POPs are also lipophilic. So once a plastic or anything containing an organic pollutant enters a system of an animal, it digests it, and those POPs are absorbed into the fatty tissues. So in animals like whales, lactating mammals, when they have their first born calf, we'll see that the milk actually has extremely high loads of POPs, and the mother is actually concentrating its own POP load into the calf, which can result in real health issues for those animals. But the question that's driving this research is, if plastic is entering fish and animals that we're consuming, plastic can be acting as a vector for the bioaccumulation and biomagnification of pollutants that we are in animals that we are actually consuming. So a couple of objectives of this study are to first just determine the density of plastics and the types of plastics that are common in the Exuma Sound, which is adjacent to the Cape Luther Institute, and also document that pelagic sport fish, such as dolphin fish, tunas, and wahoo, that are commonly harvested for either recreational or commercial consumption, just document if these animals are containing plastic. And we also had the opportunity with the passing of Hurricane Joaquin to kind of document how large storm events and how large wind events might redistribute plastic and pollutants in the surface waters of the Exuma Sound. So first, to touch on the uh, plastic trawls to collect sea sur plastic from the sea surface, we have a Newston net that's about a meter high by 20 centimeters long and is uh, supported by these two floating wings. So it kind of floats along and samples that first quarter meter of the sea surface, and it filters down to 333 microns. We then pass any contents. We'll do trawls for anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, depending on sea state, um, direction that we're heading, and other variables. And then we'll run those, the contents through a sieve so we can really pick out the pieces of plastic. Now here we have a map. Here's a Cape Eleuthera Institute. This is the southern tip of Eleuthera, and this is the north end of the Exuma Sound. Um, some of the trawls that we conducted, the dots here indicate trawls that were conducted directly prior to Hurricane Joaquin, and these hurricane symbols indicate trawls that were conducted following Hurricane Joaquin within about a week of the winds dying down to the point we could actually get out and sample. The color code here indicates the number of pieces of plastic per square kilometer. So if we look at the pre-hurricane densities, we have an average density of about 75,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer, which is still really high in relation to the plastics we expect in the Exuma Sound based on that previous study looking at plastic density in the Atlantic Ocean. After the hurricane, though, we actually have densities of up to 3 million. Here we have a density of 6 million pieces of plastic per, per square kilometer. And a recent trawl that was uh, finally sorted following me making this figure shows that we found we had one trawl that indicated 9 million pieces of plastic per square kilometer. And this is because we had a westerly wind coming from across the Exumas during Hurricane Joaquin that kind of pushed that sea surface, all the contaminants, along the eastern wall of the Exuma Sound. Looking at pre-hurricane trawls, and, which are indicated as blue, and post-Joaquin trawls, which is indicated in red here, we can look at the proportion of debris that we captured and the size. And we see that most of that debris, the majority of it, was less than five millimeters. And those are classified as microplastics. So really, a lot of the plastic that we're seeing is really small. And the size of the plastic in the environment doesn't really matter in terms of how wind or currents act on that plastic. Now, in terms of the types of plastic, we see that the majority, almost 80%, are fragments, so chunks of plastic that have broken off of something larger. We also see film, monoline, a lot of that being fishing line, um, and a few nurdles, which are plastic in the raw, raw plastic pellets. Now, if we look at a picture comparing zooplankton, this is a zooplankton here, 
these are some zooplankton up here, with plastic here, 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 we can see that the sizes, the shapes of plastic fragments, and even the colors are very similar to plankton. Now, to look at the, uh, the presence of plastic or the ingestion of plastic by pelagic spore fish, we collected a lot of fish from local marinas um, or even had the opportunity to catch a few, and we dissect the stomachs and run the, st run the stomachs through a sieve down to 300 microns so we can compare those results to those of the trawls. Um, here's an example of a few pieces of plastic we found. This piece of trash bag was found in a wahoo, and this bead was found in a dolphin fish, but the vast majority of the plastic we're finding is less than five millimeters in size, really tiny stuff. Now the proportion of fish stomachs that we look at that contain plastic are pretty consistent both with a, each other and some recently published values in the literature looking at tunas and swordfish in the Mediterranean. We see that kingfish, dolphin fish have between uh, about 26 and 27 percent of all individuals contain at least one piece of plastic in their stomach. Looking at wahoo and tunas, 33 percent of all fish have plastic in their stomach. And this is drawing from sample size of 86 for dolphin fish, 36 for wahoo, and only five tuna and four kingfish. The fact that we have small sample sizes for these fish and that results are consistent across um, all fish suggests that uh, between 20 and 30 percent of, of fish are encountering plastic in their diet. We can also compare the colors of plastic that we're finding in fish, which is indicated in red, with the colors of plastic that we're collecting during our trawls, indicated in blue, and we see that these are similar. So it doesn't appear that fish or that plastic is entering the food chain through any select selective foraging. And again, if we look at some of the plastic that we found, this is really hard to see, but there's a fragment here, a white fragment, and a white piece of film here, and they really do look similar to some of the zooplankton we see in this photo. Now, so what does this mean? Um, again, we saw that past study by Lavender Law suggests that the Atlantic Ocean, right around the Bahamas, has an average plastic density of 2,500 to 7,000 pieces per square kilometer. In the Exuma Sound, our mean value is around 75,000 pieces per kilometer. And we think that's due to um, this current that we have in the Exuma Sound, and Liz Wallace pointed this out yesterday in terms of self-recruitment of larval fish, water is drawn in from the Atlantic Ocean and kind of circulates within the sound. So the Exuma Sound might actually act as a sink for plastics. Um, we also see that large storm events can redistribute debris at different temporal and spatial sca uh, scales. Now, this is important because if we're looking at increasing storm events, changing currents with a shifting climate, we can use this information to start modeling how pollution and how debris is going to be distributed in the next 100 years or so with climate change. Um, we also have reason or the ability to look at this influence of weather and current on and forecast how... Um, how plastic is redistributing in relation to ecological events. And something that comes to mind is the sardine run or uh, maybe seabird colonies who move to a certain area to nest and feed. And these areas, if we know there's going to be high densities of plastic, we can prepare to uh, see higher levels of ingestion and health impacts on those animals. So to wrap this up, Saltwater recreational fishery in the U.S. is valued at almost $70 billion. So if we can have a better understanding of how pollution and how organic pollutants are affecting our fish with the potential risk to human health, we can better mitigate potential economic loss to that fishery. Now, we also see that 90%, over 90% of the plastic we're identifying in our fish stomachs are microplastics, and we, we think it's unlikely that tunas and dolphin fish and wahoo are targeting tiny little pieces of plastic and mistaking them as prey. So we think there's a missing link here, and that's likely the prey fish. So using this data, this is kind of a pre preliminary uh, examination of what's happening with plastic in the environment. We're now expanding the study to look at bait fish and try to figure out how that's entering the food web. So with that, I'd like to thank 
all the folks that worked on the project. And if there's any questions, we might have a little bit of time.